Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, or if anyone's watching east of New York, which is where I am, uh, good afternoon. And welcome to uh, my section of this special questions class. Uh, this is the second part of the online National Marxist School hosted by the CPUSA. Um, this is the last day, I believe it is. Um, so we'll be covering a number of topics. My topic will be racial and national oppression. Uh, this is something that uh, I've helped put together things for, for the party or have uh, kind of led with respect to the YCL. And I suppose I should introduce myself as well. I'm Kay. I am co-chair of the Queens Club of the Communist Party. And I also organize with the New York YCL. Um, and so this is part of a work in progress. And so uh, I hope we'll be able to take this forward and make some use of it. So let's start with why are we discussing racial and national oppression? Uh, ultimately, we're discussing this because it is part of the strategy of the Popular Front. Uh, now, the idea of the Popular Front is something that has existed for a while. And uh, in left spaces, in uh, communist organizing specifically, you hear Popular Front referred to when it comes to resisting fascism. And here in the United States, at this political moment, we are trying to resist fascism. And as we'll see, a modern example of um, racial and national oppression is used as a tool by uh, the ascending fascist powers to try and divide the working class. And so the key to the people's front, the all people's front or the popular front is to unify uh, across the minor differences that we have as people within the working class and to build a strong unity that is strong enough to resist uh, the push of fascists and eventually going forward, capitalists. Um, but let's speak more concretely. So, why are we discussing racial and national oppression in the same uh, class? Well, they are related but distinct things. And here in this diagram, you can see racial oppression comes from racism, which comes from capitalism, uh, which feeds into that. And national oppression comes from nationalism, and uh, that comes from capitalism as well. Uh, now, this is not just saying that we exist in a capitalist society, and these two things uh, are reinforced in capitalist society. What we're saying is a bit stronger. Uh, we can say that historically, the development of racism and nationalism have been tied to capitalism. Uh, so you look at the history of the United States, and in the early 1600s, uh, before the formation of the United States, there were shortages of labor. You had wealthy landowners uh, from Europe who uh, had claimed this land, uh, didn't rightfully belong to them, but they claimed it, and they needed to import servants from Europe and Africa. So at this time, the treatment of Africans was not yet uh, wholly as an inferior people in the colonies. Uh, this attitude didn't develop until European labor became scarce, and uh, revolts of those laborers, European and African alike, became a threat to the wealthy landowners closer to the 1700s. So in addition to the need to fight off indigenous peoples uh, upon whose lands the landowners were encroaching, uh, this need for labor really drove uh, the need to come up with an idea that would allow for um, more labor to be employed to develop this land. And so with that came the development of racism. 
And nationalism is also tied closely to the development of capitalism because as capitalism was becoming a more of a world system, something that spread across continents, uh, you had the American and French revolutions, which really, if you look at the history of the word nationalism, uh, comes out of discussing those revolutions. And so an example of the interaction between race and nation uh, can be seen in the creation of the idea of whiteness or blackness in the United States. So over time, as European nationalities, as wide ranging as the English and the Irish or the Scottish and the Prussians or the Spanish, Poles and Russians, uh, immigrated to the United States, they came to be redefined as members of the white race. Uh, and African peoples who otherwise would be present in Africa to develop their own nations uh, were stolen away to America and labeled as Negroes. So that's a bit about the historical development there. And at a bit more of a theoretical level, uh, Nationalism and racism sit next to each other in the toolbox of the same group of people, the big capitalists of the modern era. So racism and nationalism are among the tools that the capitalist class uses to divide and thus disempower the working class. Within these divisions, the oppressed suffer solely because of a status apart from their class, though the effects of the oppression are distributed unevenly depending on class. Now, that was a lot of technical terms. What exactly does that mean? Uh, for example, I am a working class black person. There are forms of oppression that I face as a black person simply because I'm black, not because I'm a worker. Uh, while say somebody like LeBron James, for example, NBA, famous NBA player, is also black, also faces oppression specifically because he's black, but um, not so much uh, as I do, because I make less money, I'm at a different per uh, I'm in a different place within uh, the class structure of society. So it's distributed unevenly, this special, uh, special oppression. The same thing applies to, say, women versus men. Uh, the same thing applies to people who might be gay or transsexual uh, or older versus younger or um, say from a country that the United States has suppressed, uh, like the Kingdom of Hawaii is a historical example. Um, so these are all oppressions that are faced specifically because of those special categories, not because these people are uh, workers. So moving forward, what is the national question? So if you do any reading on this stuff, uh, especially if you read older communist texts, you'll see this national question. Uh, what does that mean? So we have before us two images that show on the left, the United States, um, or what would become the United States. It shows the indigenous nations spread throughout different regions. Um, and on the right, we see uh, 1914, uh, Tsarist Russia. So at this time in history, in 1914, uh, this was shortly before the revolution had occurred and that area would become the Soviet Union. Uh, so this is under uh, the influence of monarchy. Uh, the Tsar in Russia was ruling over uh, dozens of different nations and different ethnicities. So the national question is presented in two parts. Who among these various nations that we see here and nationalities uh, can be organized primarily on the basis of nationality to strengthen democracy and thus weaken the capitalist class? And based on that answer, in what manner does each race or nationality participate in the struggle to strengthen democracy? So this national question is one of the key elements of Marxism-Leninism, as all existing socialist states have formed themselves in the context of national liberation movements opposing the imperialist powers of their day. Uh, in particular, Lenin's treatment, uh, that's Vladimir Lenin from Soviet Russia, uh, his treatment of the national question in the context of this Tsarist Russia that we see here is instructive for us. Like that 
uh, area, the United States is a multinational society. So in 1913, Lenin was writing about this national question, saying, why is it important to the communists in Russia to pay attention to it? And in this list of justifications, he says that uh, there are within the frontiers of Russia, what is more in her frontier areas, a number of nations with sharply distinctive economic, social, and other conditions. Furthermore, these nations, like all the nations of Russia except the great Russians, are unbelievably oppressed by the Tsarist monarchy. And so there's something of a similarity. Capitalism was developing in Tsarist Russia, and they were under the thumb of the Tsarist monarchy, uh, this great expanse of nations. And similarly, here in the United States, you had indigenous nations uh, who would come under the force of this new uh, democratic republic, uh, as well as immigrants who are coming from all across the world into this nation, uh, who would be subject to the forces of capitalism within the United States. So there's an analogy there. So we can talk about uh, drawing some lessons from history. Specifically in the United States, when it comes to our party program, the Communist Party USA party program, we deal with several demographic groups who are oppressed on the basis of race, nationality, or ethnicity. In today's US, racial and national oppression appear to us in two main forms. Racism as white supremacy, that is the idea that the white race is supreme over all others, and nationalism as nativism, that is the idea that the interests of established populations are superior to those of immigrants. The history of the US is inseparable from the history of the expression of white supremacy and nativism. White supremacy led to the genocide of millions of indigenous Americans and continues to uphold the subjugation of all peoples. Nativism led to vile discrimination against immigrants throughout the whole history of the US, but especially in times of war. And this nativism extended uh, beyond just people who are considered, you know, are uh, normal categories of minorities like uh, black people or uh, the varieties of Asian Americans or uh, Hispanic or Latina populations. This includes various European immigrants throughout the history of the US. So this is a question that affects everyone. Now, the ultimate result of the spread of such ideological poisons like racism and nationalism is a strong tendency towards the collapse of peace and democracy in all its forms, that is fascism and war. Heading down the path to war and fascism is not inevitable. As working and oppressed people, we've all inherited a centuries long struggle against it. So, speaking of ideology, due to the com combination of many different historical and social factors, uh, we had race riots in the United States that were common throughout the mid 1960s. This was growing out of the civil rights struggle. Uh, and so in 1967 alone, for example, over 150 race riots erupted across the US. Now, there was a commission that was put together uh, by the president then, I believe it was Johnson, President Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, that was nicknamed the Kerner Commission. That was called together in 1967. And it had an assessment of the country saying that our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Now, the Kerner Commission had said that there were a number of reasons that the US was exploding into race riots. Uh, among these were discrimination in policing practices, the justice system and consumer credit practices, inadequate housing and public assistance programs, high unemployment, and the exclusion of communities of colors from the democratic process. However, it is precisely against this future of two societies that uh, former CPUSA General Secretary Gus Hall argued. Now, this two societies concept covers up the reality of a two-class society. This is a quote from Gus Hall. The class of exploiters that is mainly white and the class of the exploited that is black, white, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Native American Indian, and other racially and nationally oppressed minorities. On one hand, white chauvinism is the main obstacle to working class victories. On the other hand, 
it is the main unifying element within the reactionary ultra-right and fascist movements. What anti-Semitism was for German fascism, white chauvinism is for fascist movements within the United States. And we find that to be true today. So let's take a look at uh, a graphical depiction of this. Here we see a chart that kind of depicts this two-class society to which Gus Hall is referring. This chart here was made by taking the US population and sorting them by race and net worth. Uh, net worth being what's the value of all the different types of money you hold, whether it's this laptop that I'm speaking into or maybe a business that I own. And that is subtracted from the debt that I owe, maybe from going to college. Uh, so the bars on the chart go from least wealthy on the left to most wealthy on the right. And the height of each color on a bar represents the share of the population of a color's race within that wealth group. So in the three most columns, we have the bottom 99% of US society in terms of wealth. And you see a multiracial society, uh, right? Multiracial, multinational. On the right, you see the top 1% and you see the outline of a class of exploiters that just happen to be white, just under 90%. Uh, but don't be fooled by the graph. The majority, the vast majority of all races will find themselves towards the bottom of this chart. And this data is taken from the Federal Reserve. Uh, so to give you an example of what type of wealth each of these groups held, um, normally a chart like this would be shown uh, scaled in a certain way so that you can see all of the different wealth values on the chart. But I've left the chart uh, scaled in a normal sense. So there's nothing fancy going on here. Oh, each one of these lines means $10 million in wealth. So this shows the average amount of wealth held by each member of each wealth group. So for the bottom 50% of Americans, most of them have a net worth or they have a median net worth, average net worth, pardon me, of $94,000. They don't even appear on the chart. The next 40% up from that, have an average net worth of $740,000. The next 9% over them have a net worth of $4.134 million. And the final category, the top 1%, uh, each member has an average, uh, oh, pardon me, this is not net worth, this is asset, this is just assets, not debts owed. Uh, the average is almost $30 million per person for the top 1%. So you'll also see that the largest two types of assets for the top 1% are business and financial. This clearly shows us a society where wealth is generated for and controlled by business owners and financial traders. And that's the primary split. So to make this struggle a bit more concrete, we'll talk about the fruits of the civil rights movements of the US. Now, while the accounts of the civil rights movement with a capital C and R and M in the US typically start in the 1950s. The movements for civil rights stretch all the way back to the abolition of slavery by law at the end of the Civil War. Now, for the entire time since, Black people have allied with sympathetic forces to build and defend our right to life, right to a free trial, right to vote, right to assemble and petition, and generally participate in the US as full citizens. And along the way, we found common cause with other exploited and oppressed people. And most importantly, we did not advance alone. This fact was acknowledged by Marx in the first chapter or the first volume of Capital on the struggle over the length of the working day. I won't weigh you down with the full quote, but essentially he said that white workers could not advance alone. Slavery had to be abolished for any workers to win things like the eight hour workday, for example. So just as an injury to one of the exploited and oppressed is an injury to all, a benefit to the least of us is also a benefit to all. So here is an example of one of the fruits of the civil rights movement, affirmative action. So towards the tail end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement had won a legal recognition of the country's history of racial and national oppression and a strong method to fight it, which is affirmative action. These two executive orders that you see were orders issued directly by the president saying that federal government had to eliminate discrimination based on race, sex, national origin, et cetera. 
uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is famous, uh, not least of which because of its non-discrimination clauses. Again, discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin is forbidden, not just for the federal government and its contractors, but for almost all employers. And now when you go to 1978, we start to see attacks, uh, large legal attacks that were mounted against affirmative action. And we're going to cover uh, some of the history of this. So in 1978, you have University of California. Uh, this is the Davis campus versus Baki. So up to 1978, affirmative action could be implemented in a number of ways, up to and including quotas. Our party, the Communist Party USA, at the time was in favor of quotas. A former USA, uh, CPUSA chairperson, Henry Winston, wrote in the Daily World in 1978, what is critical is that affirmative action laws must contain guarantees, or put more popularly, it must have teeth in it. Is it not the duty of the class in its own interest to support the struggle for quotas? It is a fallacy to think the white workers can go ahead against monopoly without the black component. Now, the Baki case actually represents a dual win and loss for affirmative action. On one hand, it, uh, it was a case of a white student who argued that he should be admitted to the university because his scores were good enough, but minority students were uh, had 16 reserved spots out of 100 at this medical school. And so he said, this is a sort of reverse discrimination. The court agreed that this quota system, and only just the quota system specifically, constituted a violation of uh, Baki's rights. But diversity of the student body was a valid reason to apply affirmative action, and considering race is a valid way to guarantee that. So there's a bit of ideological poison that becomes important as history progresses that is included in this court decision, which is that method, certain methods for compensating for historical discrimination that were previously legal uh, that were previously won by the civil rights movement were considered a violation of civil rights. So we go forward now all the way to 2023 and we see a loss for the affirmative action and thus for civil rights. And so in this court case, this organization, Students for Fair Admissions, brought a case against Harvard and said that considering race at all unfairly discriminates against white and Asian students. And so the Supreme Court agreed with the Students for Fair Admissions, which effectively ended the direct use of affirmative action in education and broader society, like companies and such employers, are considering the impact on them. But this decision was fueled by a lack of recognition of systemic racism. Uh, I quote from the Supreme Court decision, Acceptance of race-based state action is rare for a reason. Distinctions between citizens solely because of their ancestry are by their very nature odious to a free people whose institutions are founded upon the doctrine of equality. Well, if we're gonna talk about distinctions solely based on ancestry, we can talk about systemic racism. And one interesting character when considering that is Edward Blum, pictured here. He's the founder of students for fair admissions. And since the 1980s, or maybe even a little bit before that, he's been a lifelong campaigner against affirmative action, specifically. Uh, here's a quote from him in the New York Times, responding to a question asking if he uh, acknowledged the existence of systemic racism. Uh, the question was, I'm wondering if you believe in systemic racism, racism embedded in the institutions of American life. Because if you look at the statistics in this country, a typical white family holds 10 times the wealth that a typical black family does. There are currently only eight black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, 20 Latino CEOs. Black people live sicker lives and they die younger than white people. I could go on. What is Edward Blum's response? He doesn't believe in it. Now, when it comes to where this organization came from, where did he get the money to put together this case and such? Uh, the New York Times also asked about that. Um, millions of dollars had appeared to found this 
organization to put together the case to carry through the litigation. And so, of course, we want to know where the money is coming from for this. Now, he says, quote, I'm the world's worst fundraiser. We've never had a really robust organized fundraising campaign. There have been a handful of foundations and a handful of high net worth individuals. So we see from our chart before, if you remember, uh, that this ruling class is directly funding attacks on affirmative action because they know that it can benefit everyone. And on the left here, uh, you can see some of the foundations that have been sending in money, the Searle Freedom Trust, the Bradley Foundation, the Donors Trust. Now, I didn't know about these before I looked them up, but if you do look them up, you'll find out that these are uh, known for being right-wing sources of money, right-wing foundations. So what is systemic racism? Because this is the key here. After previous classes, we all know that under capitalism, the capitalist pays for workers' labor power in order to produce a product for sale. There's a difference between the value of the product of the labor and the price of the labor power, and we call this difference surplus value. Taking this surplus value for themselves is how cap capitalists make their money. And within the capitalist arsenal lies racism right, and nationalism. So this has infected capitalism down to its roots and out of the roots of capitalism grew uh, these methods. And so the chief force preventing unity of the working class uh, in terms, in these terms, is white supremacy, right? This leads to the oppression of all races, including the, so, the so-called white race uh, within the US. It's littered all over the history of the US from the beginning. If you count the genocide of indigenous peoples of the US, if you count the enslavement of African peoples, the forced annexation of different uh, colonies in areas such as uh, Mexico or Hawaii or Puerto Rico or the Philippines or the subjugation of any numbers of immigrants that have come in to the US over its history. So I see that uh, we're running a bit low on time. There is this case that if you are interested in looking more into it, uh, that is California's Proposition 209. Now, California actually abolished the use of affirmative action in their universities, at least the direct use. Uh, so you can't discriminate against protected groups, but also you can't give preferential treatment to them. Uh, and this was pushed through California legislature into its state constitution in 1996, um, also by right-wing forces, also by the rich. Now there was a study done, you can look into it, look up the name Zachary Bleemer and affirmative action, but essentially, because we have this uh, example of 25 years of the death of affirmative action in a particular area, Bleemer did this study specifically on California and specifically on the groups that were affected and saw that there was a negative effect on, uh, on under the underrepresented groups that were now excluded by these policies. And contrary to the language that was used by the right wing in pushing this proposition, uh, there was no benefit to the white or Asian students that were used as an excuse to get rid of these rights. So we have this idea of systemic racism that because capitalism used these tools from its very beginning in order to make money, that it has spread, these methods have spread and become an unspoken assumption that if I'm hiring somebody, it should be taken for granted that if we start to use affirmative action or we start to bring in people who are not uh, white men, that somehow this makes us uh, weaker instead of better. Um, and that somehow getting rid of these measures would benefit white men when we have multiple studies that show that it doesn't, um, up to and including the history of labor in the United States. Now, here we're looking at the ideological aspect. This was a survey done by Pew Research in 2021 to ask people's opinions of the legacy of slavery and what should be done about it in the United States. On the left here, we see a chart. The green shows 
Uh, the green side shows a percentage uh, next to the group. So at the top, you see all US adults, 58% think that um, the legacy of slavery affects black people in the US. Um, so they think 58% of adults in the US think it, it affects them a great deal. Now, you'll see this is the majority opinion in every category except the Republicans, which are now trying to overthrow democracy in the United States. So uh, not sure how much weight we should give that opinion, except uh, and how to plan against it. Now, the notable thing here is the difference between these two charts, because on the right, we have a picture of who thinks that we should support reparations for descendants of enslaved people. In every single group on the right, less people think that we should support reparations for descendants of enslaved people than think that there is a gap caused by the history of slavery in the United States. And so this is one example. This is talking specifically about slavery and specifically about African-Americans. But for all groups that have been oppressed, uh, on the base of race and nationality. Uh, this is the kind of thinking that we have going on in the American public, is taking a step, taking multiple steps to resolve these issues. Uh, some groups are not convinced, right? Um, so in terms of what we can do as a party, and this is something that we're trying to do through this educational program that we're putting on now, and something that we're uh, working with our educational department uh, to make sure of is that we are on the side of trying to convince people that, yes, the legacy of the United States history does affect what's happening now, and we do need to compensate for it. And not only do we need to compensate for it, but we can do something about it, and we can do something about it within our lifetimes. Because all the change that I just talked about um, with respect to affirmative action is within a lifetime. There are people who might be watching this uh, who have been alive to see the progress of these things go back and forth. So uh, change is possible, positive change is possible. And that's something that we need to make sure that people can see and do the work to build. So when it comes to building uh, the ideological aspect we're doing that right now. And I encourage you to go out and share uh, this recording with uh, people. We'll be sharing this wider as well. Um, and in terms of the political aspect, we have elections coming up in 2024. So we should be doing all the work that we can to make sure that everybody can get to the ballot box so that the voice of the entire American people is heard. Because let's not forget, just a few years ago, and even going into this election, we have people who are viciously trying to deny people the right to vote, no matter uh, no matter what their opinion is. This affects everybody, um, but especially those people whose uh, voices have historically not been heard. And when it comes to the economic aspect, we have the strikes, the plethora of strikes that are going on. Uh, WGA, I have not been up to date with the news, but they should have received news this past Tuesday of their strike deal. Uh, UAW, the United Auto Workers, who are still on strike uh, to oppose General Motors and the other two uh, manufacturers of cars and auto parts and things as such. Um, the video game workers who are now going uh, or ready to go on strike. I'm not sure if they've gone on strike quite yet, but they've authorized a strike. Um, so all of these different economic groups, these political groups, these ideological groups um, that can be activated exist within the working class. And if we look at the spread of these things, like you look at this chart, these charts that are before us, uh, it represents all races, all nations throughout the US. And if we look at where the civil rights movement um, in the 60s left off, we have this proposed budget. Uh, this is called the Freedom Budget for All Americans that proposed something to the tune of, I think it was about 
point something trillion dollars in modern terms uh, to extend the gains of the civil rights movement to all Americans to ensure that people had housing, people had access to employment, people had access to wealth, uh, welfare if they did not have employment. And this is what um, the Poor People's Campaign that Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, helped start up in the 60s and that is now being revived uh, in 2020. Uh, this is where they have started up their work. And so as party members, as friends of the party, as people who are concerned about the future of democracy in the United States, uh, we should do well to take this from the past and bring it into the future. And that's all. Thank you, Kay. Give us a moment. Okay. All right. Thank you all uh, for coming today. I'd like to thank Kay for their uh, presentation and their in-depth explanation of uh, special oppressions, because that's what uh, we're focusing on today. And uh, I'm going to be building upon some of the concepts that uh, they touched on in their presentation, um, specifically uh, the economic and ideological poverty um, that uh, Kay spoke of. Um, you know, when Kay talked about, when Kay showed these graphs and spoke to us about what Americans believe, um, the, the youth is increasingly uh, alienated, um, increasingly uh, dejected, and um, frankly depressed uh, just because of the capitalist mode of production, relations of production, and worsening conditions. And as a result, um, there's a lot of ideological poison out there, and that is something that just um, can't be overstated. Uh, the youth are subject to a whole lot of uh, misinformation from the capitalist class and their different uh, media outlets. And um, like I said, it's just something that can't be overstated. But um, to begin, youth is defined as the period between childhood and adulthood, depending on who you ask. Uh, youth could be children, adolescents, or young adults. The United Nations General Assembly and the World Program of Action for the Youth to the year 2000 and beyond identified youth as those persons between the ages of 15 and 24 years. In the same program from the UN, data is presented showing that the youth make up approximately 18% of the world's population. That is approximately 1.03 billion people, but the vast majority of these uh, young people living in, developed in developing countries. Sorry. In the U.S., uh, youth are largely employed in hospitality and uh, retail, um, different industries like that. Uh, we all know that you know some jobs are referred to as you know kid jobs, things like fast food, um, retail, grocery stores, things like that. Uh, when in reality, we know that uh, people from all different age groups, uh, races, and other categories work these jobs, um, but uh, these workers are largely unorganized. Uh, these workers receive low wages and work in horrible conditions. Um, if you've ever worked in the food industry like many youth do, you know that uh, labor rights are not something that uh, are particularly given a whole lot of uh, weight. Um, you may work a 10, 12 hour shift in a kitchen and not get a break. Uh, may not have even a break to drink some water, get some food, whatever you need. Um, I've spoken to many workers in hospitality industries, specifically youth workers in hospitality industries who face all kinds of harassment, all kinds of uh, different oppression from uh, management and receive no protection uh, at their jobs, receive uh, no compensation and receive no, um, uh, no, they're not insured that, uh, you know, this harassment or this uh, infraction won't be committed again. Uh, so these youth uh, workers desperately, desperately need unions. Um, but to continue, in addition to the poverty created by exploitative working conditions, the youth are also saddled with increasingly large amounts of debt. According to a report, 20% uh, of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 have unpaid debt sent to a third party for collection. 
Um, so this creates uh, a new level of economic precarity for young adults. Um, whereas maybe 50, 60 years ago, you might have needed to perhaps take out a loan to pay for your house. Today, the youth need a loan uh, to go to college, to get a vehicle. Um, they need a loan you know, to have housing. They need a loan for just about anything that isn't an immediate uh, need. And this um, ties the youth to these ginormous banks and um, eventually just kind of sets them up for a life of uh, a kind of indentured servitude to the banks. And uh, it's a very horrible economic situation. Uh, in addition to facing poverty and increasing debt, the youth are enduring a mental health crisis. The Center for Disease Control states that in the year 2018 for youth ages 12 to 17, that 15.1% had a major depressive episode, 157 made a suicide plan, and 8.9% attempted suicide. Additionally, 16.5% of school-aged youth have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Uh, considering poor access to preventative care, uh, like therapy and things like that for working class people, we can assume that these numbers are much higher. And um, this is a, a study from 2018, so it doesn't take into account um, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the different uh, mental health uh, ills that uh, have plagued a lot of working class people since then. Um, and uh, this is primarily due to increasingly uh, increasing wealth inequality in a, in a class society. Um, obviously, the alienation uh, that we are subject to as working people is, uh, takes a, a massive toll on our mental health. And as um, wealth inequality increases, uh, this class stratification of society only becomes more intense and more uh, nakedly oppressive. And um, it creates a very bleak outlook for the youth. Um, if you're familiar with the culture inside of a workplace that's primarily youth, um, it's really not uncommon to hear young people, you know, 19, 20 years old, uh, encounter a, um, a minor inconvenience. And uh, they'll say something like, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself, uh, something like that. And it's, um, it's uh, taken as a joke at this point. A lot of people are just desensitized to it. And um, it's really just a manifestation of a, a much larger issue. Um, the youth are terribly, terribly, terribly oppressed. And um, the youth also face constant attacks on their already low standard of living from the capitalist class, the right wing, and corporate Democrats. Poor funding for public education, the erosion of labor rights, and other neoliberal economic policies have left the youth thoroughly exploited and without the educational means necessary for a united fight back. In modern America, the youth find themselves engaged with the interlocking crises of capitalism at every turn. This creates a broad basis for unity between students and workers at home and the youth across the world. Because of these poor conditions of living, learning, and working, youth have united to struggle for better conditions for themselves and their peers. The labor movement, the struggle against fascism and for peace, and the struggle for healthcare for all are just some of the struggles that youth are currently involved in. And these are struggles that the youth have historically been involved in. Um, if we look back to World War II, uh, we find that the youth were uh, instrumental in the struggle against fascism. If we look to the peace movement, uh, civil rights movement, we find that the youth were deeply, deeply involved in these movements for change. In addition, the Movement for Student Loan Forgiveness brings together a coalition of working youth, students, and older workers. Generations of workers face the prospect of lifelong debt just for aspiring to a greater level of education and standard of living. The refusal of the ruling class to act decisively on the issue of student loan forgiveness has clearly shown this coalition of youth and workers that the capitalist order does not prioritize education for the masses and does not intend to. Um, the current struggle for student loan forgiveness is testing masses of working people in the greater struggle against fascism and for peace. When the power of banks and the military industrial complex is reined in, working Americans will have greater access to education, culture, and economic opportunity. The revitalized labor movement also brings together a broad coalition, including the youth. Gen Z is the most pro-union generation in America today 
with a mean approval rating of 64.4% compared with 60.5 for millennials, 57.8 for Gen Xers, and 57.2% for baby boomers. According to a report from the Center for American Progress, youth are leading organizations drives at youth are leading organizing drives at restaurants and warehouses and on campuses. Young workers have shown organizational discipline and strength in struggles against employers for union recognition and fair contracts. But still, union density remains low. It's about um, 10 to 11 percent of the workforce in America. Um, if the revitalized labor movement can win gains similar to the industrial union movement of the 20th century, we can raise working and living standards to a level never seen by American workers. I believe the highest union density the American working class ever experienced was around 50 to 55 percent, if I'm correct. And with uh, a generation such as Gen Z that is so pro-union, uh, we could uh, potentially see a union density in America that is uh, even higher than 50 to 55 percent. And um, the uh, the economic gains for working people would be, uh, you know, I don't want to say inconceivable, but um, for the standard of living that most working people experience, you know, uh, it would it would really be a huge step up and a, a massive uh, gain for the working people. The movement for safe and legal access to abortion, as well as the struggle for full equality for women and the LGBTQ plus community is a movement largely organized by the youth. More youth identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community than in previous generations, and the right wing is ramping up its attacks on these groups in an attempt to maintain an order where discrimination is the norm and um, low wages prevail. The basis for unity and the struggle for full equality for women is massive. Unity crosses class lines and causes splits in the ruling class. Uh, this is very important for us as communists to recognize. Uh, because splits in the ruling class um, can be exploited. And uh, this, this means um, better terrain for us to struggle on. Another movement largely led by youth is the movement for climate justice. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of youth live in developing countries. And the youth in these developing countries really bear the brunt of, you know, the disastrous effects of climate change. Uh, they already... Um, face food insecurity, and on top of this, uh, climate change threatens worse economic uh, fallouts from natural disasters such as flooding, uh, wildfires, and uh, all the different kinds of things we've, that have become normal uh, since the acceleration of climate change. Uh, the movement for renewable energy and jobs in the energy industry brings together youth, students, workers, and even at times capitalists. This struggle is directly tied to the struggle for peace because the U.S. military is one of the largest polluters on Earth. Without a unified struggle to end U.S. military occupation around the world, climate change will continue. And uh, the youth notice this or they realize this. Um, many uh, movements for peace uh, directly indict, you know, the capitalist class that is um, sort of uh, leading the, the call for war in uh, whichever country. Um, for instance, in the invasion of Iraq, you know, um, organizers in the peace movement brought to the, uh, the front, you know, the oil interests that were leading a lot of these actions. And then the war in Ukraine, obviously we have uh, oil interests, we have um, political interests, and a number of other uh, interests at play, um, particularly finance capital. Uh, BlackRock is um, profiting massively from the war. Uh, but the path forward for the youth is a uh, class struggle. No other means of confronting the social ills of capitalism will secure a future for the youth across the world. The youth have demonstrated international solidarity in the struggle against war and fascism in the past, and a, uni a new united front against fascism is being built and tested in the day-to-day -day struggles that youth find themselves in. As communists, we need to be aware of the conditions of the youth and the struggles they are involved in. We should provide support to their struggles so that we can foster solidarity between working class youth and students and the broader working class.
the Youth Labor Alliance is needed to defeat fascism and to struggle successfully for socialism. Without this alliance, the youth are estranged from the struggle for socialism and the working class is estranged from the struggles of the youth, creating perfect conditions for sabotage by the capitalist class. The capitalist class thrives when young and old workers are disunified and pitted against one another. Right-wing media blames the youth for various social and economic problems in an attempt to steer criticism away from the capitalist class. Struggling against corporate media narratives that pit young and old workers against one another should be an area of focus for comrades involved in the youth struggles. Um, one example of this that uh, also has to deal with you know, racial and national oppression is uh, in the movement against police violence. Obviously, in um, 2020, we saw massive international solidarity among the youth protesting the murder of George Floyd and uh, police violence in general. And in response, uh, right-wing networks, Fox News and, and the like, came out and uh, just accused the youth of being, uh, you know, rambunctious and uh, not understanding, you know, uh, how the police need to work, accusing the youth of, you know, being violent and destroying property and all these different things, um, attempting to make this less about the state uh, using violence to um, maintain a certain order and more about, oh, you know, the youth are crazy and, and uh, they're going to be crazy and there's nothing we can do about it. But as communists, we must struggle to bring the class analysis to the youth struggles against climate change, against discrimination and for student loan relief. When the youth can grasp revolutionary theory paired with their unparalleled compassion and devotion to change, anything can be accomplished. And um, I'd like to just close out my uh, presentation with a quote from Youth Against Fascism by George Dmitriev. Um, we can and must place in opposition to fascism the union of all anti-fascist forces, first and foremost, the union of all the forces of the young generation of working people, at the same time enhancing thousandfold the role and activity of the youth in the struggle of the working class for its own interests and for its own cause. Um, I chose this quote because that is primarily, uh, as uh, Kay mentioned in their presentation, uh, we're presently struggling against fascism. And uh, the Popular Front is designed to drown fascism in a sea of resistance, as uh, one slogan puts it. Um, and the youth united with uh, the working people are the broadest coalition uh, possible. Uh, we have, you know, in our unity, the power to end fascism and war and secure a future for all working people. Hello, my name is Michelle Kern, and I am doing a presentation on women, the working class, and special oppression in the United States. Okay. A brief outline, we'll be talking about the total population of the United States, the women, the composition of women in the working class, including how many are in the labor force and how many in organized labor, a definition of special oppression, reviewing examples of special oppression for women, and some approaches to aiding and combating special oppression. So the total population of the United States for women is 50.5% or some uh, just a bit over 168 million as of 222, our last census. And our definition of special oppression from the party program, the most important allies of the working class are those who suffer special oppression due to capitalism and are also overwhelmingly members of the working class. Special oppression is discrimination, ex extra exploitation, and social domination based on race, nationality, gender, and or age. Many features of special oppression cut across class lines and affect to some degree all members of each oppressed group. And the special oppression of women cuts across class lines. This cross-class oppression means that women play a progressive role as a social group. 
the composition of women in the labor force, women in the workforce, number 56.1%, in contrast to the number of men in the workforce, which is 67.6%. Uh, labor force participation for women has been improving somewhat since the Great Recession, you can see in the chart below. Women in the organized labor force, as of 2021, 9.9% .9 of female wage and salary workers were members of unions, compared with 10.6% of their male counterpoints. And of union workers, 47.1% are women, and 37.4% are people of color. So in talking about examples of special oppression for women, this is by no means a complete list. It's only representative of a few issues to illustrate scope limited by our time permitted today by our program. Low wages and racist super exploitation, limited access to better paying jobs, poor maternal health outcomes and reproductive oppression, low representation in elected office, violence and femicide, and sexual harassment in the workplace. Low wages and racist super exploitation. In wages in 2021, women who worked full-time in wage and salary jobs had median usual weekly earnings of $912 which represented only 83.1% of men's median weekly earnings of 1,097 per week. More working women, 3.4 million than working men, 3 million lived below the official poverty level as of 2020. The poverty rate for women overall in 2020 was 12.6% with men overall having a 10.2% poverty rate. 13 out of 10,000 women are homeless. Women of color, especially Black and Hispanic women, experience some of the highest rates of poverty at 21.5% and 18.8%. And Black women are paid 64% of what a white non-Hispanic male makes at his job. Even though women's participation in the labor force had improved post the Great Recession, uh, COVID had an effect on wages and jobs for women. That was quite noticeable. Job losses were most heavily concentrated amongst low wage workers in the service, leisure, and hospitality service industries where women and individuals of color are more likely to work. Many women also reduced their work hours or left work entirely to care for children who are not in on-site schooling during the day and also many reduce their hours to care for elderly relatives. Female non-college graduates at work decreased by 5.7 percentage points, and male non-college graduates at work fell by 5.5 percentage points. Women who reduced their hours or dropped out of the workforce temporarily are also at risk at losing opportunities in the future for raises and promotions over the rest of their lifetimes. Uh, women also experience limited access to better paying jobs. So lower paying pink collar jobs are overwhelmingly staffed by women and not always by choice. There's a growing body of research that shows that the low pay of many female dominant occupations has nothing to do with skills, but rather simply because they're done by women. Almost two thirds of minimum wage jobs are held by women and men in female dominated fields still tend to make more than women in the same fields. You can see here the pink collar jobs referred to on the last slide. These are the 10 occupations employing the largest number of women as of 2018, hasn't changed much. Uh, teachers, nurses, nursing, psychiatric and home health aides, secretaries, cashiers, customer service representatives, retail salespersons, waiters and waitresses, and first-line supervisors of retail service workers and managers. Another special oppression is women's poor maternal health outcomes and reproductive oppression. In 2021, 1,205 women died of maternal causes in the United States compared with 861 in 2020 
and 754 in 2019. In 2021, the maternal mortality rate for non-Hispanic Black women was 69.9 deaths per 100,000 live births, 2.6 times the rate for non-Hispanic white women, which is 26.6 per 100,000. Overall, maternal deaths have spiked in the last three years with an increase of 40% between 2020 and 2021 alone. Black women are three times likelier than white women to die from a pregnancy-related cause. As of last year, Roe versus Wade being repealed by the U.S. Supreme Court, the abortion law post-Dobbs has had uh, a significant e economic impact. So costs for an abortion have jumped 41%. Traveling for an abortion to another state, which is now the regular way things go for women who live in a state that has illegalized abortion, um, can be from 900 to 950 or up to 1200, depending on location. The median out-of-pocket cost for a medication abortion in 2021 was 568, up from 495 in 2017 and the cost of a first trimester procedural abortion, medical abortion in 2021 was 625, a 32% increase from four years before. Women also suffer from low representation in an elected office. Only 28% of Congress is composed of women, which is a 59% increase from only a decade ago has not come close to representing the population of women in the United States, which as we said before was 50.5%. The Senate is only 25% women and currently has no black women senators. 61 women of color currently serve in the 118th Congress as voting or non-voting members. Just under half or 29 of them are black, 20 women are Hispanic and 11 are Asian American and two are Native American. Only one woman has served in the executive branch in elected office, and that is our current VP, Kamala Harris. In state office, total overall in the country, there are 2,276 women, including 552 women of color as of 2021. These women represent 30% of state legislators nationwide. Women hold 557 state Senate seats, 28%, and 17, 19 state House or Assembly seats of 32%. Only the state of Nevada seats 50% women in elected state office. And as of 2023, only 12 women out of 50 serve in state governorships. Violence and femicide, it's also a serious issue. 25% of women experience intimate partner violence compared to 11% of men. In the U.S., almost three will, women are killed by an intimate partner every day. More than four out of five indigenous women reported that they had been the victim of violence, usually by non-Native men. The national homicide rate for Black women and girls in 2020 was eight homicides per 100,000 people, four times higher than that of white or Latino women. In 2020, half the 46 recorded homicides of trans, trans and gender nonconforming people nationwide were killings of black trans women. More than 11,000 women in the United States were killed with a gun between 2015 and 2019. Every month, an average of 70 women in the United States are shot and killed by an intimate partner Owning a gun makes an abuser five times more likely to kill their partner or using one to threaten or assault their partner, which makes the victim's risk of being killed 20 times higher. Sexual harassment in the workplace, also a serious barrier for women. Studies show that 25 to 80% of women have reported sexual harassment in the workplace. That number changes depending on explaining to women that sexual harassment is not just rape, but can also be coercive behavior, misogynistic abuse, and retaliation in the form of 
not offering raises or good evaluations. 72% of women workers who have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace have reported retaliation against them for reporting. The cost of sexual harassment can have significant economic impact on women victims, anywhere from 125,600 to $1.3 million of lost wages over lifetime and opportunities, depending on the professional field. The cost of a single year out of work for an apprentice in a construction construction occupation translates into a lifetime loss of $230,864 due to lost wage progression and foregone benefits. And they, in this chart here, you can see that there are other costs that come with sexual harassment, direct costs, uh, consequential effects, and the intangible costs. Sexual harassment forces women out of traditionally male-dominated jobs and into lower-paying jobs often held by women. Healthcare costs, including for therapy for the harassment, are often out of pocket and further rob women of savings. Vulnerable women, such as immigrant women, suffer greatly from sexual harassment in the workplace and often fear reporting due to status and being threatened with deportation for reporting. The lifetime cost for each rape survivor is $122,461. Social issues are economic issues. What can we do to aid in combating special oppression? We can foster cross-class unity and also intergender unity amongst women who are not in the working class. Supporting women's organizations, working to expand leadership of women in office, passing laws to combat special oppression and support families, including laws to raise the wage, childcare, and expanding SNAP. And last but not least, we should work to end voter suppression tactics, which often suppress the vote of women, especially women of color. Thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoyed this. Elias, you want to open your mic? Okay, yeah. So, uh, just as a preface, uh, as I, as you can see by the title here, um, this is a brief uh, statistical observation on the Hispanic working class of the United States. It includes some um, uh, analyses, uh, mainly again from a statistical perspective uh, on the various factors of the Hispanic working class in the United States. Um, and yeah, I think we can get started. In this presentation, we will go over three major factors of the Hispanic working class uh, within the US. Uh, those three factors are composition, uh, the occupational factor, and the electoral factor. Uh, Composition-wise, 47.2% uh, of the Hispanic population uh, live in cohabitating households consisting of married couples without children, uh, and 25.5% live in cohabitating households with children. Uh, the majority of the Hispanic population rent their homes with a median rent of 1,226 per month. 15.8% of Hispanic households are food insecure. Approximately one in five Hispanic households lack some form of health insurance. 17.1% of Hispanic households are overcrowded per unit. About 61% of Hispanic households take home less than 62,500 total per year before taxes. And most Hispanic individuals achieve high school graduation as their highest form of education at around 27.8% of the Hispanic population. Um, these compositional statistics give us an idea of some of the living conditions of uh, Hispanic individuals uh, within the United States. Um, and now we can move on to the occupational factor. Um, as expected, the vast majority of Hispanic people work for private entities. Uh, the five most common jobs for Hispanic men are construction laborer, production supervisor, truck driver, 
food service supervisor, and janitorial service. Uh, and the five most common jobs for Hispanic women are maid or housekeeper, cashier, registered nurse, secretary, and customer service representative. Um, as you can imagine, these jobs come with a higher uh, occupational hazard rate than most jobs, particularly uh, white collar jobs that are occupied by uh, 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 primarily white men and uh, partially white women. Uh, the unionization rates for the Hispanic population are uh, relatively small, about the same of the rest of the population. Uh, for Hispanic men, it sits at 9.1%, and for women, it sits at about 8.5%. Uh, the composition of the most commonly unionized fields for Hispanic people in the United States is uh, protective service occupations for men uh, at 34.6%, transportation and warehousing occupations at 14.5% and manufacturing occupations at 13.8%. Uh, for women, it's education, training, and library occupations at 33.7%, protective service occupations at 29.8%, and healthcare support occupations at 11.3%. Um, again, these are uh, mainly physical demanding jobs uh, that the unionization rates uh, are at for these positions. Um, in the electoral realm, uh, some of the most important issues going into the 2022 midterms for the Hispanic population were economy and cost of living at 80% being the most important issue, healthcare at 71%, educational policy at 70%, takes on violent crime at 70%, gun policy at 66%, voting policy at 59%, and abortion at 57%. Uh, an interesting observation is that abortion support uh, raised from 42% to 57% uh, past the Dobbs decision taken by the Supreme Court. Religion is a sharp division in the voting patterns of Hispanic peoples. 50% of evangelical Protestant Hispanics prefer Republican candidates, whereas 59% of Catholic Hispanics and 60% of religiously unaffiliated Hispanics prefer Democratic candidates. Unsurprisingly, Trump staunchly remains a political opponent of Hispanics. 73% of Hispanic voters say Trump should not remain a national political figure, which rises to 94% among Hispanic Democrats. Hispanic voters have some make or break issues and would definitely or probably not vote for someone who they disagreed with on these issues. Uh, abortion at 43 to 26%, gun policy at 38 to 28%, immigration at 32 to 29%, and economy at 30 to 31%. Uh, this chart here is a study that was conducted by the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, the study was titled Unleashing the Power of Poor and Low-Income Americans. Uh, it was released in 2020. Considering that Hispanic Americans, along with African Americans and Native peoples, are among the most common minorities which live in poverty, this Poor People's Campaign study shows that barring voter suppression, uh, uninterested politics and accessibility due to lack of time and or disability remains some of the biggest obstacles to a better election participation rate among Hispanics. Both graphs show that the largest issue uh, is either uh, an uninteresting politics that the voters did not uh, see a mode of change in or uh, were quite literally too busy uh, to participate. So things such as uh, making voting a national holiday or um, uh, having a politics uh, that offers a future to believe in or a greater medium of change uh, as we've seen during some certain campaigns in 2016 and 2020 uh, show that they might be uh, optimal routes again barring voter suppression to increase turnout in that regard uh, from the study I quote, 
uh, a large proportion of the electorate is not participating in elections because they are not motivated by a particular candidate who might make a difference on issues that matter to economically vulnerable families. And given that uh, the Hispanic population is set to become the largest minority in by 2045, I believe, uh, these are observations that can be taken uh, to account in the greater struggle for uh, incorporating larger parts of the Hispanic population into the struggles for democracy and against fascism. And that's the uh, essence of the brief observations on the Hispanic working class of the United States. And I have a list of sources here at the bottom. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, this is Molly. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions. And uh, we're going to take uh, as many questions and comments as we can uh, and then turn it over to the speakers to respond. Uh, so I am looking for raised hands from those who would like to contribute a question or comment. Krista Chan. Hi. Um... Thank you everyone for the presentation. My question is if I could get some um, recommended introductory readings about the national question. Thank you, Krista. So I am looking for more raised hands. Mohsin Sadiq, your mic is open. Thank you, Comrade. My comment is uh, uh, something that Comrade K talked about is that the reparation. There is a discussion going on in the third world countries that for the, for the last 50, 60 years since decolonization started, the Western countries came blaming the, the underdeveloped countries because they, they're lazy, they are not, they are not productive, they are not imaginative. That's why they're underdeveloped. The fact of the matter is that the resources of those countries have been sucked off and there was no capital left in those countries, basically. There's a demand for something like a reparation that the, the Western countries should be paying back the African countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So I think we need to think about in more global terms how, how the demand of the African Americans in this country is sort of sort of similar to the, the global demand for equity and justice, for example. And I think we need to think a little more globally and come up with a, 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 a strategy that we can all also benefit and participate in. Thanks. Thank you, Mosin. Uh, Jack, there you go. Thank you. Uh, these were all very cool, invigorating presentations. Uh, Luke and Kay, you specifically emphasized that changes can happen within a lifetime and can happen soon. And while that leaves me very excited, it mostly makes me wonder, well, how do we do that? So I will leave you with a very open-ended question of, how do we do that? Thank you, Jack. Um, one comment that I'd like to share uh, is um, to the youth question. Um, I uh, it, it is there's Luke, you brought in so many aspects of the impacts uh, on youth, and um, some that are sitting with me are um, the role of social media um, and also AI, and just in general with the youth uh, consumer rights um, and the kind of acquisition of our data um, and growing up as kids with it. Um, another one is like gun violence and in general, um, just the carceral system uh, and the unique impact that that has on youth um, in, in, in bringing them into um, you know, violent um, encounters um, with each other in the state. And um, third, like the, the thing that just kind of stuck out to me kind of coming from Elias's presentation was actually, you know, abortion is, is a youth issue. Um, you know, um, the people who, who need uh, reproductive freedom, um, you know, tend to be youth, but also, um, you know, goes into, uh, you know, the 40s as well. So, I um, just wanted to contribute that. I see uh, we have William Miller. Uh, your mic is open. I well, uh, just wanted to say this is a great presentation uh, by all three of you. Uh, I really like the stats that Elias threw up there. I think it's very informing. It tells a lot. And on Keyes in, that was a great presentation. 
And uh, one of the things I wanted to add to what Q was saying was on uh, the role that um, communist organizations have made uh, made in the past to help promote um, racial equality. For instance, the role that the Communist Party played with the Scots for Scott for boys back in 31 and um, primarily uh, and, and this is a huge influence on me was the Black Panthers. So I just wanted to throw that in there and thank you so much for presentations. They were great. Thank you, William. I want to turn it back over to the to the speakers. Yes, now. we're going to turn it back over to the speakers for your final comments. Um, we'll start uh, with Elias and move to Luke and then to Kay. Well, first of all, thank you to um, Dee and Molly for uh, organizing this. This uh, coming from an IT background, this type of stuff takes a lot of work, so I appreciate it. Um, secondly, um, thank you for the kind comments on all of our presentations as well. Um, the uh, points about the uh, statistics uh, for the, uh, the Hispanic working class really only give uh, a modicum of the, the picture for the greater struggle uh, for uh, equity uh, for racially oppressed minorities inside of the United States. And um, uh, also to your point about uh, the uh, abortion issue, I think out of all of the issues voters had listed on, I don't think any of them saw as sharp as an increase as abortion had. I think that was a 15 point jump in a matter of months, which is you know uh, massive in the greater uh, electorate, quite honestly. And um, as we all know, uh, with the recent special election data that has been coming out, uh, it shows that the Dobbs decision was major, major in shifting uh, the electoral front as it stands at the moment. So uh, these are all great observations. And uh, as materialists, it's important we recognize the statistical end of things. Uh, it's the only way to really get an accurate view of um, our uh, perspectives on the various uh, forces that make up the working class. Thank you. All right. Well, um, first, I'd like to thank the other uh, presenters, Kay and Elias. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who came and watched and contributed um, uh, to uh, the questions we had. The um, the comrade, I forget their name, but they asked, how do we enact change? I would simply say get educated and get organized. Um, you can, uh, for instance, uh, join uh, the Communist Party. Um, you could join, honestly, a, a book club. Start reading revolutionary texts with uh, your coworkers and people you know. Um, that's something we're doing here uh, in Toledo, the San Paolo Club. Uh, we are also, you know, attending the the picket line at the Jeep plant in town and talking with those workers. Uh, we have an article from the People's World uh, we're distributing. So, you know, building working class press in the party. Um, Honestly, just doing what you can to advance the interests of working people in your community is uh, how we start to enact change. And um, the youth are are down for it. Um, our club is primarily youth um, and quite a few youth women and women of color. So um, to to Molly's uh, different impacts, you know, like like the uh, the abortion question that absolutely affects the youth. You know, uh, youth are the people that need abortions. Youth are the people that are going to need abortions in the future. And reproductive health care in general is something that affects the youth along with everyone else. And um, this isn't just a struggle over abortion specifically. You know, this is the beginning of the chipping away uh, of, of many of our rights. You know, Molly also mentioned the consumer uh, rights and, um, you know, the access to the data that the uh, capitalist class has on us. It's absolutely insane, you know, like Molly mentioned with the advent of the internet and uh, <clears throat> all these different types of social media, not only does it accumulate all that data, uh, which in result turns to capital for the capitalist class, um, it also, you know, increases the alienation, which is one of the, the most devastating effects of the capitalist mode of production. Uh, we're so alienated from each other uh, specifically as youth that, you know, 
a lot of uh, a lot of youth, you know, simply don't know how to talk to uh, their coworkers, don't know how to talk to people in their, in their community, and start to enact that change. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, a lot of these issues that primarily concern the youth. And to be honest, I just have bullet points because I've been very busy um, uh, at work and with some personal stuff lately. Uh, but yes, absolutely, um, gun violence too is another large issue that uh, increases the alienation of workers and also um, contributes to the capitalists accumulating profits. Um, but yeah, those are my answers. Thank you all to, um, thank you all who came out and uh, participated. I would also like to thank everybody for participating on this. Uh, I, I'm sure it's better other places. New York is like flooding, but it's a pretty nice weekend afternoon um, and thank you to my fellow presenters for their presentations rounding out the discussion on special questions uh, because there are a lot of them and it's a lot of work uh, to do on one's own which is why we work collectively um, which brings me to add to what Luke had just said about how do we change things um, really there is we, we've advanced a lot since a lot of the people that we read have written their thoughts on how we can make progress. But even so, there's so much to do. Um, like something that has been weighing on me because I've been thinking about the, the upcoming 2024 elections a lot is that there's like somewhere between a quarter and a third of Americans that just don't vote. Um, and so even something like organizing people to go out and make sure that there are uh, vehicles or people to get out of their houses and vote, um, making sure that there's like some sort of public transportation or something like that, or, you know, just reminding people that it does uh, matter. Like that in and of itself could be enough to sway results in so many different elections. Um, and we have many historical examples of that. Um, in terms of like economic stuff, there's union support, and then there's like trying to organize a union in your own workplace. Um, I I used to work for a big like tech finance company. Uh, I at least tried to talk to people. It was tough. It didn't work out. I I've since left the, that company, but um, you know it it really well. I won't say it can't hurt to talk because it literally can. Um, as you know, <laughs> but you know, I I myself feel better having given the effort uh, and trying to to do that. And there were some improvements that I was able to make, even so, because not everything needs to be a union, right? You could even organize just small things that your coworkers do with one another to combat the the just the pure alienation that goes on in a lot of these spaces, like the uh, the comment that Luke made about uh, youth that would just like make jokes about them committing suicide really rang true. Um, Cause I, I mean, I hear that a lot, um, but yeah, there, there are so many, so many ways to change things. It really is a matter of learning and getting organized because once you start, that puts you, uh, kind of at the forefront of things. And a lot of times all it takes for something to take off in terms of organizing is for someone to step forward and say, hey, like I care about this and I wanna change it and we need some help. Um, so you know, that can be very powerful. Um, in response to, I think it was most seen, uh, yeah, there does need to be a, a global demand for equality between nations. And that is something that does come out of the civil rights movement as well. Um, especially in the 60s, you saw a lot of oppressed nationalities, uh, races, even like other specially oppressed groups like women or um, the LGBTQ groups uh, forming their own movements kind of on the same template as like, you know, we deserve to exist publicly in society. Um, and so, you know, if you're building on a concept of unity, there's no way for you to build unity at home and not build unity abroad. 
like it's not consistent. Uh, so we push for that here, and that in turn changes our policy uh, abroad. And so we should continue to do that. You know, the civil rights movement famously opposed to uh, the wars that were going on that were waged by the, the United States then. And our movement also needs to be opposed to the wars that are being proposed or that we're funding uh, here in the United States, because like half our taxes go to that stuff. Um, in terms of introductory readings on the national question, um, I read Du Bois, I read Lenin, I read Henry Winston, um, and then there's like, those are people that I read like in, in the past few weeks. And then there's a bunch of other people that include like everybody up to and including like Sojourner Truth and Forward, uh, maybe things about like the Irish national struggle against the, the oppression of the English and things like that. But just to throw some titles your way, uh, there was 100 Years in the Struggle for Negro Freedom uh, by W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, he also wrote Black Reconstruction in America, which covers what is often referred to as the first civil rights movement, the Reconstruction. Um, and those two really set a lot of this Marxist terminology in the context of the United States, which is really excellent. In terms of like uh, original ideas, you can read theses on the national question by Lenin, uh, as well as the right to, or the right of nations to self-determination by Lenin. Uh, and then the uh, recent party produced literature um, is, I think you can look up like national question and then search specifically on cpusa.org. And there's a lot of stuff that's very recent, but in terms of a book, there is Strategy for Black Agenda by Henry Winston. And I believe you can find a PDF online. I'm not sure if it's uh, back in print yet for international publishers. I think it's supposed to be at some point, um, but you can check all of those out. And again, uh, thank you everyone for coming out and thank you to my fellow presenters. Thank you to Dee for helping put this together and uh, I hope we can get out there and turn some of this theory into action. Okay, uh, thank you all. Um, very humbled by uh, your work. Uh, thank you, Molly. And we'd like to invite everyone to uh, to stay online. We'll leave things up. We do have a class in about, uh, what, uh, 30 minutes. We do have our, our, our next class in about 30 minutes. And so we'll leave everything up and we invite everybody to, to, to stay and uh, continue with us. Very, very humbled by all of your contributions uh, this morning. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and it, it uh, regenerates our confidence in the future. We'd like to express our thanks to Michelle Kern for taking the time to produce a recording on uh, the topic of the special question uh, related to women. Uh, so we'll end this class at this time uh, and thank, uh, uh, thank all of the presenters again. Thank you uh, very much. And we'd like to acknowledge that uh, Luke had a loss in his family. Uh, and he uh, was able to uh, still uh, join in and, and make his contribution. We'd like to acknowledge the loss of his grandmother. So thank you. And we, uh, our next class will uh, begin in about 30 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>